Hi. So I'm not here today to tell you how to build websites. I think uh, everyone in this room has a pretty clear idea of how they're doing that currently and how they'd like to be doing that. So what I'd like to do is rather ask you a, qu a question on what experience are we going to be building in the future? What kind of experience do we want our end users to have on our sites? And how are we going to get there? And when I think of websites, and, and I really, there's two in the market here about websites and applications, I see that there's quite a distinct usage pattern across those. Uh, I, I, I really kind of went through this a few times, and it seemed really obvious. Uh, but when I tried to put it down on paper, it took a while. But what I came up with is that websites are content-driven, whereas applications are purpose-driven. And what I mean by that is that if you want to find something or search for something or research something, you're likely to go to a website. And we generally call that browsing. So there's the clue in the word browsing. Whereas if you want to do something, if you have a purpose, a task, an action to complete, you'll probably pick up an app. So what I think we're aiming towards is to start building something that's a hybrid of both. And I like to kind of collectively call this umbrella term of client-side, single-page, JavaScript, and hybrid applications. I like to wrap that up and just really talk about them as native web, web apps. And what we want to do out of that is to provide a purpose-driven experience to our user that they're accustomed to on mobile and desktop applications, but still deliver it over the web, through the net, like we used to do with um, our websites. It's the best delivery mechanism so far, um, and we should really make the best use of both. So with that in mind, our end user and our user experience that we're trying to deliver is is, kind of, is, is paramount. And we should be aiming to engage our users, to provide ways to interact with them. And we'll do this, and we'll com accomplish this primarily through our user interfaces. And they need to be more responsive, more reactive, and really update in real time. There shouldn't be any lag and disconnect between someone taking an action and what we display in our UI. Um, and we're not going to try and break the web here. The web has got great standards, it's got great technologies, so we're going to take the best of those and really deliver that. And HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are everywhere. They're in all the browsers, they're on all the devices and platforms, and they're really just getting better every year as more people engage with them and we expect more from them. The, the standards are improving and we're able to do more. And we really don't want to ask our users to jump through hoops when, um, when visiting our websites or downloading our applications. So these technologies are there to, to make sure that the barrier to entry is very low. So our real challenge around building user interface is that they're hard. And they're hard because managing state is just, it's just the devil. <laughs> um, when a person clicks on a button, we have to manage, track that state to say, has it been clicked? Have they, are they changing URLs? Are we moving through page transitions? Have they created an asynchronous event? Are we waiting for data to come back from the server? Have, has that person made five asynchronous events? And when are they going to come back? What order are they going to come back? And how are we going to show that to the user? That is the challenge behind user interfaces. Um, and currently, when we, when we serve up websites, we, we kind of avoid that to a large degree, uh, and we rely on page refresh. So it's all about choosing the right tool for the right job. I don't think there's, there's any technology or one language that solves all your problems, and I think each of you has got particular use cases, a particular product that you're going to build solving a particular problem, and so it's important to understand the limitations and the benefits of, of your choices. But being aware of what can be done and how we do that is probably, is probably the most important and making good choices. So talking about JavaScript frameworks and libraries, which are there to support creating amazing interactions 
um, that can deliver our content to the browsers. Um, we, should, we should really break those two down into two kind of categories, which are frameworks and libraries. Um, and depending on your, your level of confidence and experience and what you're trying to achieve, you might choose to build your own and just pull in the libraries where needed, or you could choose to take a full, full framework. Um, and I personally prefer frameworks. Um, it's just a personal opinion, but I find when working in teams, the frameworks obviously apply good design patterns, uh, good structure to your code, and they tend to kind of guide you on the path of best practice. And so when working in teams, it's really important that everyone's kind of on the same page and working in the same way. But again, it's, it's a personal preference, and you need to, you need to evaluate your own, your own stack and see what's important. Right now in the market, we got three, three or a whole bunch of really powerful frameworks, and there's lots more libraries. I've just picked out four kind of, you, I, I think, a lot of you would have heard of these frameworks, and possibly some of you are using them already. So there's Ember.js, Meteor.js, React, and Angular. They're, they're really progressive, and they're really allowing us to do things that we haven't been able to do before. Um, and they're just kind of different, different ways of achieving the same goal. It's a, so we would like... So if you're looking at a project and you're starting new, Meteor might be a good choice because it, it, it describes your end-to-end -end service and, it, and prescribes your database and your server as well as your front-end technology. Whereas Ember is kind of a, a more front-end orientated but gives you very good structure around your routing and your data store and a persistence layer. Angular is even easier to get going and they don't really describe how you do your data store. Uh, and React I throw in there because it's, um, it really, they really target the view layer, and they've done that like, incredibly well. Um, and each of these frameworks has influenced each other in some way or other. Um, so it's important to know when you would consider building a native web app. And I, I've worked on a couple of projects converting existing systems to use web, web client-side technology and out the box starting from the beginning and, con and building client-facing apps. And the first, first one that stood out to me was when you find yourself duplicating code between the back and the end and your front end, um, when you see yourself rewriting template rendering to deliver content in the browser, which you've already rendered on your server. And if you're using a templating library, a JavaScript template library like Handlebars or Mustache, um, this is probably this is probably a clue in that you you know you can start moving your presentation up onto the client. If you're doing some UI prototyping, if you're still figuring out what your application is going to do, what the purpose of it, how are you going to assist the user in completing their task, I think it's it's a good good call to maybe look at these. Um, and a big one for me is if you're if you're working in real time, if you're working with real time data, um, we've got web sockets and and concurrency thing, you you're going to look to have some way to update your state in the browser. There's no good waiting for time delay, having stale data, a stale display, needing your customers to refresh. You need some way to actively manage that state. Um, and, and using a, a JavaScript library to, to help you do that is, is a good call. And again, like I was mentioning earlier, we've got kind of two states on the web, content-driven and purpose-driven. So generally, anything behind a login on your website has a completely different look and feel and a completely different use case. And generally, that's very purpose-orientated. Behind a login also, you can kind of avoid worrying about how your search is going to be um, ranked by Google, your SEO, things like that. So you can really focus on how you're going to uh, help your user accomplish what their task is. So. We're here at ScaleConf today, and architecture and how we architect our um, services is is kind of a very important, very important and hot topic. And I think we're traditionally all very comfortable with the client-server architecture, rendering most of our content on a server, uh, and, and then pushing out just your H, your rendered HTML that can go to the browser. Um, and that works. And I think if you're comfortable with doing that, and you've got your services running. Stick with it. There's no reason to change. But 
if you find you're running up against some of the problems I was mentioning earlier, or you're not achieving the level of engagement that you want with your customers, I think you know, we should start looking to, to, to change that up. Um, and we can do that incrementally. And I don't think it's a radical change. I just think we should start looking at a pattern I like to call the smart server, smart client. And all that really means is creating a clear separation of concerns between your back end and your front end. So shifting your presentation to your client, to your front end, and putting the tied logic that, that handles that application state on the front end. There's no need to be mangling that, that logic and that code on your back end. And what it really drives out is on your server, you can have a very clean API endpoint that services now many different clients, whether they're web or mobile or desktop, all in a very similar way. And you can test that to death, put unit tests behind it, and your expectations on your APIs are always going to be, be pretty clear. Um, uh, and yeah, keep, keep the things that are good on the server. Servers are great at serving static content. They're great as being, being your database access and storage points. And they're great at handling long-running batch processes. You know, we don't want to move that kind of stuff to the client. And we sure, sure don't want to move our business logic to the client. We've, we're still offering a service. Uh, and we have security and rules and business logic to apply. So let's keep, that on, let's keep that on our server. But let's move the presentation, which is what the user sees, how they interact, how we help them, how we think ahead for them, and how we help them get their job done. So kind of tying back into this architecture theme, um, how, how, do I run my, um, how do I run my web servers? Well, I just have static assets. When you, work, when you work with moving your client, when you work with moving your presentation to the client, you find you only end up with a few files. You've got your index file, which is just it's your first request, uh, and you've got some two external assets, which would be your compiled JS file and your compiled CSS file. So how do I handle my servers? I farm them out to CDNs. That's my long and short answer. So, I, I kind of like that pattern. I don't. I don't. I know my expectation of my users. I know what what I expect my UI to do, and I know what I expect my backend to do. And I don't have. I don't have mixed concerns there. So, I'm going to kind of move straight on to a demo here. Um, I think I'm going through my slides really quickly, which gives me some time. That's great. And um, the demo I'm going to do is is to build Hacker News using Ember as my client-side technology, and Firebase as my back-end API endpoint. So Firebase has an, can, uh, can be accessed as an API or over a WebSocket layer. Um, and they really kind of give you that out the box. What that does is, is it frees me from really actually worrying about uh, managing an entire server right now. So the actual, as we saw with the index file, I just need a, uh, a simple host that can just serve up the index HTML, and then all the other work happens in the CDN and on the client side. Um, if you'd like to follow on, you can uh, you can check out the code on uh, the GitHub my GitHub account, um, and the actual API which I'll walk you through is is on the Hacker News API. So let's see if this runs. Where are we at? So Hacker News is just a simple listing page of news items, and sorry, okay. So we're getting a delay between when I get on my computer on the slide. So it's a simple listing page of, of the top-rated news stories that get upvoted by by users, um, generally about development, and it's a pretty good resource if you if you don't know about it so far. Um, and then there's a lot of comments per article, and people people um, comment on comments, and so we've got a recursive tree structure here. So what I'm going to do is just show you what I'd like to build. And we're going to build it using Ember.
what we'll have is we'll have the page render. It'll fetch data over WebSockets. It'll do the presentation. Um, and then we'll traverse into the article and the content or all the comments, which is a recursive tree, is recursively walked um, and asynchronous um, calls are made to, to fetch content. And as they come back from the server, we update the DOM. Uh, one of the nice things is once, once that data is fetched, <laughs> so, so right, once the data is fetched, uh, we actually have it cached locally, so tr transferring back to our list or back into one of these news items uh, has no cost. We don't need to do external data fetches. Um, and as an Easter egg, what we'll do is we'll just, we'll just take those static assets that we have, that index.html, um, we'll, we'll run our um, preprocessor build script, which does uh, JavaScript compilation and CSS compilation, copy that into PhoneGap, uh, and just for a, just a proof of concept, we, we can just get ourselves a nice little mobile app out of it. So I'm still of the opinion that we've got a long way to go in terms of hybrid apps. Uh, so this is more uh, a test case for me, um, but you can definitely use your same code base to do this. And depending on what your requirements, that might be good enough. So this, these two screenshots were, were done I'm using, um, using my phone about an hour before the conference. So the comments and, and what it's doing should be, should be fairly realistic. So getting into how this, uh, how to actually build, build that type of product with, with Ember is the first thing that Ember really differentiates itself from any of the other frameworks is that it's very um, configuration, uh, a convention over configuration based. And, and what drives that is, is the data models. And they have a very, very well thought out um, model, model layer and a database persistence layer that backs that up. So what's interesting is if we look at the, the top stories API endpoint that we get from Firebase, it returns an array of items. I think it's about the top 500. And those are in key positional value. So the, the first item uh, in that list is, is the top uh, and second and so forth. So it's zero, zero index based. Um, and over time, those positional items swap out. So in Ember, modeling data it should be quite familiar to if you've used any client or any, any MVC on your server. We just create a model and we set up its relationship. So on here, we're just setting up that each, each top story item is going to have a relationship to an actual um, story item. And, and we're going to fetch that data asynchronously. So what's important there is that when we access that model, if we don't have it in the local data store, it'll actually do a network request for us. Either, either through um, a REST API, if, which is the default that it ships with, or in our case, we're going to use a Firebase, Firebase socket endpoint. And it'll asynchronously fetch that data, and when it's available, it will render itself into our templates, into our DOM. We don't have to worry about that, and we don't really have to manage that state. Um, the rank is a, a computed property. So basically, it just l looks at the model, and it says, anytime ID changes, I want you to recalculate what my value of rank is, and anything depending on me, I want you to either continue recalculating down the pipeline or render this into the template. And as I mentioned, the ID attribute is, is zero indexed. It's a zero indexed array, so we just, we're just base tending it and incrementing it by one to get, to get a, a visually appealing one. Um, the next two items that we're going to model out here are for every story, we're going to have a story item as well as a comment item. And Firebase uses um, a NoSQL database structure. So the, uh, the fields that it returns varies. And we just model, we're going to model out those two variations. But recursively, what we're seeing here is that 
we have um, kids, a children attribute or a kids attribute that comes back in our JSON store, and that refers to other items which are items on themselves. So it's a so it's a self-recursive lookup here, and then a whole bunch of other attributes that we'll we'll be using to to make uh, our presentation of our data. Comment item is this, is this still the same a API endpoint. It's the item endpoint. We just got different data, and in this context, this comment is the descendant of a, of a parent item. So modeling that is a little bit more, more confusing, or there's just more data. So there's more relationships, um, and what we can say is the parents has a belongs to relationship, so each item has, may or may not have one parent, whereas it has many children. Standard, standard relationship modeling here. And so we can really use very simple syntax to, to get the children and get the parents. Um, and Ember provides nice shortcut terminology to do calculation. The number of kids is just what is the, what is the length of our, our kids array and return that as a number of kid property. And we start working with this pattern of as data changes, we can then recursively see what impact that has. So the number of kids defines if, if this item is a parent um, and we've got some equality operators which, which just check if we're, we're dealing with a story or a comment because, because it's a shared, shared resource. So, so our Firebase adapter, what we need to do is um, we need to model, we need to map the data we're getting back, the Johnson data we're getting back from our, from our API endpoint against our models that we're going to internally use as JavaScript objects. Um, and to set that up is really just import the Firebase adapter, give it your API endpoint, which is Hacker News here. Um, and I've, I've left in the adapter for item. And really what that, that's doing is, is, is just to show you that this, is, this particular piece of code could have been left up because it works on convention over configuration, and if you don't write these assets, they will be uh, inferred. But I put it in just to show you what, what the path, so that will, will find the API endpoint. And then with the top stories was, because, it, because we're returning an array, not an array of Johnson, um, it, gets, it gets unusual that we then need to We just need to override one of the default behaviors of a find, a finding all. Um, and so every time an event of child added, added is received from the server, we need to just handle the behavior of assigning the ID of, of the key to the object that we're going to handle. And every time that I, item is changed, what all we're actually doing is saying, the object remains constant. We know we're going to have 500 objects that, res, that are our ranking, but the the items that they associated are changed out. And so the second one is when your child is changed, we're going to just set the item property to null, and then the item ID, we, we set that value. So we force um, an, a, another call to filter through the chain. Um, and that's that. Once we've got that, it really is left to, to just building out our, our roots and our URLs and build some templates. So. Uh, you'd probably be very familiar with just kind of how to set up a root. Two, two variations there. One is a standard root that, that doesn't have a, a dynamic parameter or a segment, uh, and the other is the item and the user. Okay. So again, what we need to do on the roots is just now, now we're getting it, now we've set up our data and we've structured how our model's gonna form. What we need to do is we need to define how, what data we need at a particular point and on, on, our, on our different pages. We can still think of them as pages. And our router is responsible for collecting data that might be asynchronously and we might need that to be resolved before actually rendering the template. So um, in this instance, finding the top stories is important to, to have resolved. Um, so we ask our local store to get the top story objects and in this case, we're not passing any parameters, so we're going to get all of them, all 500. Um, and we'll do we'll do some filtering and pagination on the controller, but really we've got access to these, this information in our data store. If we don't have it, it'll make its first network request out, and thereafter it'll cache those objects, and we can just 
call it as, as we need it and filter and map through that data. Um, and the second one is just the item. So the real difference is we have an item ID and so we're looking for a specific item in the store. And again, on first request, it's not gonna have the item in the store. So it'll make a net re request, resolve that promise, and return that data for our, for our controller to, to map to the template. And yeah, this is, our, this is our template. So now we're actually all the way down to rendering HTML, and we've, we've just got access to our top stories. So for each top story, we'll iterate, make a, make a list of items, and then we will, through this chain syntax, ask for the stories item and its title. So again, here, we don't have to explicitly load the item um, on the controller because the, this will be an asynchronous event. And when, when it loads the first time, it'll just get the key positionals and then it'll ask as it needed, which is right now in the template, for this item. And when that item resolves, it will render the item's title and so on. And we can just iterate over over different properties of that item. Um, and for each item, we're going to do a simple, similar thing. We've got one item object, so we're just going to render out probably that top story, what that story detail is. Uh, we'll put the title in the page. And then the, the interesting part about this is that um, items have children. And for each item, we need to see how many children we have, and we need to get those children, and we need to look at if those children have children, and we need to get those children, and so on and so forth. Um, and so we have what we call the comment item template, and that's, again, just iterating over each comment related to an item and assigning it to a collection. And the collection here is just a, just a templating shortcut, which wraps, wraps a for each loop in a particular uh, HTML style, so you can have ULs and LIs, or divs and divs, or table rows and table table data. Um, and yeah, we iterate over that. And that basically is how you would build that entire application out in ten slides. Um, so I. I found that particularly interesting. I, I think the two challenges I, th I thought I would encounter is walking the tree, um, but when you start thinking asynchronously, you make predictive assumptions that when this data resolves, I can then execute more code, and when that data comes back, I can then execute it again. Um, and you don't have to worry about doing some fancy SQL join to get all your data to, to make some crazy for each loop uh, on your server to present that data. Um, and the other, the other advantage is with that type of structure, uh, if the data, uh, the positional data in your top stories arrays changes out, it just updates your, your DOM automatically. So there's no extra work needed for me to figure out, okay, have I got new data? Should I update the DOM? It's all handled, literally in those slides. So that's my presentation. I'd, I'd love everyone to just get in contact with me. You can come and find me afterwards and, and chat to me if, if, if you have questions. But that's just to kind of give you a taste and see maybe how you could be thinking about your applications. And if there's value in that, definitely consider it. Um, and yes, please ask, please feel free to ask any questions. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Don. Any questions All around the room? Hello, thank you for the presentation. Um, seems quite interesting. I'm just wondering, uh, generally the, the paradigm we all work under is based on the page you're on, you need to get a collection of data. Maybe it, it is a matter of doing one MySQL query, where something like that could potentially mean multiple hits from a single user. How do you manage that? So it, it, it does require a slight shift in thinking. Um, and I found when I was building webs, you know, this, that type of uh, website, and especially something if I was to do that on the server, is that you would have a lot of custom SQL to kind of figure out how you want to present that data. So you're doing, you're doing SQL queries for specific pages 
for a specific presentation. And it's got nothing to do with what your data is and how you're storing it. Um, and different pages have different data that you're gonna need to load up front, and so you're gonna run maybe more than one query, or yeah, it gets a bit weird. Um, and what I found is that when you start thinking in this type of kind of structure, you're, start, you're starting looking at the, using your API endpoints. You start leaning on them very heavily. And your API endpoints provide that kind of structure and that clean separation to say, this is an object. When you ask for it, I'll deliver it. So I, I understand the question. I, in, in this particular instance, and that's why I was trying to show you, your top stories um, array is 500 items. So th that would traditionally feel like 500 web requests. But if you're using sockets, sockets have a lower overhead than your traditional AJAX request. Um, and that was that, that video was in real time, um, so there was no and, and over my phone at whatever our signal strength is here. So I fetched 500 items and displayed in the page using sockets. And and because you're using frames in socket-based communication, got much lower head overhead. You're hitting your server and you're asking for very specific items. So story item 9321. So you can cache that on the server. So your server's not even having to think about that. It can just almost return a response automatically, and you're sending JSON down the wire. You're not sending presentation, and I think that's a big change. It's, we're so used to building these big HTML documents and sending it down the wire, um, that now we're actually just sending short, fiery bursts of packets. And uh, you, know, you, you make 500 requests out, maybe they don't come in the order that you want them, but as soon as you get them, you can start rendering them. So you create this much more interesting experience of things are happening. Um, uh, whereas I find if you, if you hit a page that's intensive, that needs to perform very, a lot of database queries uh, and, um, and you're not able to cache that frequently, that you're just going to have a real dead time between page reloads. I, I hope I answered that question. Any more? In the middle. <laughs> Hi, uh, how do you deal with backwards compatibility, if at all? Like, for instance, in South Africa, we've got a lot of Blackberries still on the market. Um, how, do you even consider that, or do you like just kind of branch and have traditional old stack for Blackberries, for instance, and then like this new stuff would apply to newer phones? So I think I was trying to illustrate that we're talking about native web applications. We kind of need to figure out what our what our customers are, what problem we're trying to solve. Um, and you really have to tailor your solution to fit that. So, um, yeah, legacy browsers are, will, will, will be a problem still for, for, for applications that rely heavily on JavaScript and uh, new features like HTML5. And, um, and there's, no, there's no silver bullet here. This is just, it could be the right tool for the job. Um, and pretty much on a BlackBerry, I'm not sure what, what you're trying to do for your client. Um, so you, you're welcome to come chat to me, and I can maybe give you some ideas on that. But I would really consider that we're looking from this point forward. We're saying, you know, people's expectation have changed what they expect your, your, your service to do. Mobile, and app, mobile apps and desktop apps have really kind of come a long way. They were... And, Websites have kind of stayed, uh, stayed static for a long time, and now we're trying to bring more more functionality to them. We're trying to use like lots more plugins to try to engage with our users. So when you start hitting that kind of problems and you start needing to move to re real time, I think w these solutions might start becoming uh, really elegant for you. Um, and I, and, and I think, you know, just a word of caution, don't change it if it's not broken, you know. If you've got service that's working really well and your customers love you and you've got no complaints, well, don't change it. But if you're finding that, you know, it's not performing as well as you want to, your customers are kind of looking elsewhere and they're not as engaged as you'd like them to be, then you need to find a solution. Great. So obviously, uh, all these these frameworks have been around for a while. Some of them are newer than others. Sure. Um, and our industry is becoming more and more and more specialized every single day. Yeah. Um, are you finding it? Have you found it easy to find specialists, developers, designers who can code in these frameworks? 
as a, as a position, or is it still quite new, especially here in this country? I think, I think you know, we're seeing a rise in, in, in what, what would initially been called like a front-end developer. Uh, I personally have worked across the full stack, back-end, front-end, DevOps. Where, you know, I've done a lot of different types of development. Um, and I'm really enjoying working in the front end because I've never actually been, had this much control of my UI and, and, and to be able to do really interesting things and work in real time and, and maybe just even get my app on, on mobile devices. Um, and I think, I think what's important is, is you know, that segregation between you know, who's doing front end, who's doing back end. It can be important, but it can also hold you back. And I feel that if more people could bridge that gap to be competent on both front end and back end, now I'm not asking anyone to be a designer here, I understand <laughs> that's a very specialized skill set, but there's no reason you can't be building really interactive websites. And, 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 I, and I'm, if, I would be very surprised if no one here knew how to use JavaScript to begin with. I think, I think it's been around, it's on, in all our browsers. We've touched it at some point. We might have just been doing a very light touch, but um, so, yeah, I think I think more people should, should maybe just look to broaden their experiences, um, and I think I think you do start seeing like what's expected of a front end developer or a, what what we would maybe call a JavaScript developer is 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 getting more and more important, and JavaScript uh, with Node Node coming onto the server is is kind of really pushed it forward into us what it can do. Good stuff. One more down here. No one asking me what Angular is better than someone else. Well, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, just moving back to the idea of the communication between the smart client and the smart server. Yeah, sure. Um, and you've spoken about, okay, opening up a socket, moving stuff between the, the, the two sides. Do any of these frameworks have uh, preferences, best practices, or even limitations on how or what kind of protocols you should you should use between the client and the server, messaging, uh, transports, etc. I think the only one who prescribes a, 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 that that level of, of detail is Meteor. Meteor provides a server, provides a database. Uh, I believe it communicates on UDP, so it's got a very specific protocol that uses. But all the other ones are really will give you the tools to build. Uh, user interfaces and manage the state in the user interface. They might give you supporting layers to, to handle your data objects around that, uh, but they don't prescribe how you communicate with your server. Um, so you can really, you can choose it to be a, a REST endpoint or an API, um, a WebSocket or whatever protocol works with your, with your, with your project. 